Genesis chapter 10, verse 1, Genesis chapter 10, verse 1 says, Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah. The title for the sermon this morning is The Sons of Noah. Okay, The Sons of Noah. And um, I'll just tell you, this chapter is challenging. There's a lot of names, it's genealogy. Um, it's probably, when it comes to preparing sermons, I would say this one took me the longest. If I worked out all the hours I spent going through this, it's taken me the longest out of anything I've ever preached, okay? Um, I'm actually, well, yeah, I mean, as far as preaching week in, week out, definitely uh, the most research I had to do. And so I hope we can take something out of this, because it is challenging, obviously, when you have a, a heap of names, you know, what kind of, you, you want to you wanna end a sermon with some practical applications as well. So actually, that was the easiest part of the sermon. But the hardest part was going through all these names and trying to uh, see what the Lord is, is teaching us. And, you know, I don't want you to become people that read through genealogies and it just goes over your head. And I must admit that, you know, I, I can't say this never happened to me. You know, you read for a bunch of names, you want to get through it as quickly as possible to get through the rest of the Bible. But, you know, God gives us this detail for his reason. There's always something behind it. And what you'll find is a lot of these names, the, the, the descendants of a lot of these people, play prominent roles in the Bible. Okay? Or we can also look at our modern day. And, uh, and see how some of these nations, some of the families and nations that exist today, where they've come from. You know, maybe you'll find some of your answers to see as we go through this list. So we'll start going, off, going through it there in, in Genesis chapter 10, verse 1. Now, these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, of course, and Japheth. And of course, those were the three sons of Noah that went on the ark with him. And it says here, and unto them were sons born after the flood. Okay, so they had children after the flood, though in obedience to the Lord, who told him to be fruitful and multiply, they had sons after the flood. And verse number two, the sons of Japheth. Now, I've mentioned to you guys last week, I think it was, that Japheth would become the father of the Europeans, largely the Europeans, okay? Now, when, we're, when I say these things, when you hear these things said, you know, Japheth would be the father of the Europeans, um, Ham, the, the father of, you know, sort of the Africans and, and things like that, and, and, and Shem, of sort of the, the um, you know, sort of, you know, people from Arabia and, and those kinds of countries. Obviously, we've gone thousands of years after this, and there's been, you know, mixing, you know, intermarrying amongst all these kinds of people, okay? So obviously, what we see today may not necessarily be fully accurate to what we know of the nations today, okay? I don't know about you guys, if you've done a DNA test, I have. Yes, a, a large portion of my background is from South America or central, central to South America. But then there were other things that were random, you know, just random other places in the world. Because obviously we've been mixed, you know, we're, we're heavily mixed. And I, I hate the, t the idea of, of people, you know, lifting up one race above and after, uh, after another. I, I totally hate it because we're all of one blood. What we see here, you know, Noah is our grandfather. You know, Noah's our granddaddy. He's the one that came off the ark, and we all can trace our heritage back to Noah and back to one of his sons, okay? But still, it's interesting to go through this. So let's have a look at verse number two. And the sons of Japheth, and of course, like I mentioned there, the Europeans, one, one of his sons is Goma there. And Goma became the progenitor of what we know today when we read the Bible, the New Testament of the Galatians, of the Galatians, okay? Um, which, you know, Galatia today is in modern-day Turkey, but the people of Galatia, at the time of writing at least anyway, had a, a Celtic background. They have a, a, a more of a Celtic, you know, European background. And then after Goma, it says Magog. You may be familiar with the word, with, with the name Magog in the Bible. Um, you probably know of Gog and Magog, you know. And um, that's where we, we the, the Magog would be the progenitor of the Mongols, of the Mongols, okay. Now, if you know what the Mongols, the Mongolians are, they're people that resided in, in sort of, in what we you know, know of Russia today. Or, like most of, most of the descendants are lived, uh, moved and, and, uh, in Russia and also in China, okay? And that's why when you look at the Mongols, they look like this half-breed of Asian and European people. It's kind of like this mix that's happened there. They're the Mongols, and of course, that's where you get the idea. Well, maybe if you've heard of prophecy teaching, people speak about, you know, the last days, Gog and Magog, and they point to Russia, you know, um, you know making war against, you know, against the Lord. One, one, of the, one of the great misconceptions with that is a lot of people, prophecy teachers, teach that the battle of Gog and Magog will happen, you know, either prior to the rapture or during the, you know, the seven-year seven period, which Daniel prophesizes of. 
But actually, if you read the book of Revelation, the battle of Gog and Magog occurs at the end of the millennial reign. So Christ is reigning for a thousand years. Satan is then loosed from his bottomless pit. And then he gets armies from Magog and, and they make war against uh, Jesus Christ and his nation. Of course, I don't want you then to turn around and go, well, see those Mongols, I knew they were evil people. All right? <laughs> because there's easily a thousand years that take place before that war. Okay, so obviously that's talking about people of that region. Whoever's li living during that region at that point in time will be the ones making war okay, against uh, Jesus Christ. And uh, another one, next, na next name there is uh, Madai. And many of these names, you'll start to see uh, a lot of the, the people, the peoples that would come from them, they're named or places, um, cities are named after these people. So it says Madai there. That's where you get your Medes from. Okay, and then it says, um, and Javan and Tubal. Uh, Tubal would become the progenitor, pro, pro, progenitor of uh, settlements that went into the Iberian Peninsula and even into Italy. Okay, Tubal there. And then, uh, and Mesha and Tyrus, verse number three, and the sons of Goma, Ashkenaz, uh, Riphath, and Togama. Okay, so Ashkenaz, that's probably one that we want to stop and th talk about for a minute, okay? So if you guys know, there are, when we talk about the Jewish people, modern day, I'm talking about modern day Jewish people, okay? They usually divide themselves into two categories. And one of those is the Ashkenazi Jews, is the Ashkenazi Jews, all right? Now the word Ashkenaz basically means Germany or German, okay? Now this is why when you look at the Ashkenazi Jews, have you ever wondered why they're totally white? <laughs> why they're blonde hair, white, it's because they're not actually Semitic people. We're looking here at the descendants of the Europeans, okay? And the reason why they're Jews isn't because, well, maybe, like I said, we're all intermixed. So, you know, we, we could make the argument that maybe, you know, Abraham is their father biologically, but he's probably the father of many of us biologically. with all the mixing that's occurred over the thousands of years. But they're predominantly of European, uh, you know, background, you know? And, you know, the reason they're Jews today isn't because of their DNA. The reason they're Jews is because of their religion, okay? And that's something you've got to keep in the back of your mind is when the Bible speaks of Jews in the Bible, it, it's not necessarily the modern-day Jews because the Jews of the Bible are largely those that came from those, the nation of Israel, okay? Especially toward the end when they, when they were divided into the two kingdoms. But what we call Jews today that may not have any reference, in fact, many times when it comes to the Ashkenazi Jews, really have nothing to do with the Israel of the Bible, okay, with the Israel of the Bible. In fact, their religion is a Christ-rejecting religion, okay, Judaism is a Christ-rejecting religion which plays, which has nothing to do with the Old Testament. Because if you were an Old Testament believer, even though you did not know of Christ, that's basically Old Testament Christianity, Everything about their faith pointed to the coming of Christ. You know, the, the true Israelites of the Old Testament were believers, and when Christ came on the scene, they accepted Christ as their Savior by default, okay? Because the religion of the Old Testament is not the same as the religion of modern-day Judaism, okay? Just keep that in the back of your mind. Here that, you know, um, that the Ashkenazis are actually uh, Europeans here, okay? Ashkenazis. Now, you know, when I did, Christina also did her DNA test. And you know what was found in her? 1.1% Ashkenazi, all right? Now, let, let, let's talk about this for a moment because I want to I cover this very quickly because there are some Christians, many, many Christians, many churches today that teach the Jews are very special people. You know, if you bless them, you know, God's going to bless you. And God's going to bless you. And some of you guys know I got locked out of my house, was it last week or the week before? And I got a, a locksmith to come and open the door. And I mean, these guys were white as, you know, I thought they were from Germany or Ukraine or something. And I asked them, oh, so what's your background? They said, oh, we're Israeli. <laughs> we're, we're Jews. We're from Israel. You know, and so the idea would be, well, did you give him a tip? Because if you gave him a tip and you blessed him, then God will bless you. That's, I mean, honestly, it sounds ridiculous, but a lot of churches, a lot of Christians teach this. Okay. Now, my wife, 1.1% Ashkenazi. You know what? In, in, in these Christian Zionist realms, my wife would be just a regular Christian. You're plan B Gentile. You know, you're lucky, you know, you're lucky the Israelites rejected Christ because you're plan B, you know, because they rejected Christ, Christ then had to make a decision of dying on the cross and, and making himself available to the Gentiles. But you know, my wife, if she decided to become a Christ rejecter, 
If she says, you know what, this Christianity stuff, I don't care, I'm 1% Ashkenazi Jew, I'm going to turn to Judaism, she'll probably be more important to the eyes of believers, the Christians, as a Christ rejecter, right, believe in a false gospel, okay, because of a 1% DNA test that came, than just being a child of God. I mean, this is what I, this is what I really despise, this is what I hate about a lot of churches today, when they lift up people because of their DNA, because of their background. Now, I don't mind if you decide to bless my wife. It's actually a blessing to me. <laughs> but bless her because she's a child of God, not because she's 1.1% Ashkenazi. And uh, just very quickly, I remember going to a wedding for someone in my... Uh, I won't mention the name. But I went to a wedding, and one of the relatives, the guy was wearing one of those little Jewish hats, as I could said. And I think... I don't know if I asked the question or someone came back to me and goes, yeah, he's actually not Jewish. He's like uh, Spanish or something. <laughs> but he found out someone in his descendancy was a Jew, so now he's converted to Judaism. <laughs> That's just ridiculous. Apparently the guy was, a, was supposed to be a Christian prior to that, okay? Anyway, I just wanted to show you this, that actually they're, they're Europeans. They, they even call themselves after the one who would bring forth the Europeans, not the one who would bring forth the Israelites, you know, in, in this story. So I hope that's interesting for you. And then, of course, Ashkenaz, verse number three, Ashkenaz and uh, Rip, Ripath and uh, Togama. Togama would become the progenitor of the Turks. Verse number four, and the sons of Javan, uh, Elisha and Tarshish. Now, Tarshish would be familiar to a lot of you guys. You know, the, the prophet Jonah is very popular. Of course, God called Jonah to go and preach to the Ninevites. And Jonah, afraid, he didn't want to do the job. He tried to run away, and he went, as he was trying to run away from the Lord, he was headed toward Tarshish. Okay, so you, you'll read about that place quite often in the Bible, and Tarshish is, a, is, is in southern Spain. Is in southern Spain, okay? Um, then there's Kittim, and Kittim is basically Cyprus, the island Cyprus, um, where Barnabas was from. Remember Barnabas? Well, Barnabas was a Jew, but he, he was born and well, he grew up. He was from Cyprus, and he, he joined Paul in his missionary journeys. And even when he had that contention with Paul, do you remember that? About Mark? They had, a, they had an argument about Mark. Well, Barnabas took Mark to Cyprus to go and edify the saints there, to go and, and confirm the saints there. So there were definitely believers in Cyprus. Uh, verse number five. Verse number five. By these were the isles of the Gentiles. And this is the first mention of the word Gentiles. Okay? So it is primarily a reference to the Europeans. But of course, as many things in the Bible, it starts to become a reference to anybody outside of the nation of Israel, okay? But this is where the first mention of the word Gentiles comes from. Gentiles just means nations, okay? Um, so, by these were the eyes of the Gentiles divided in their lands. And something else I want you to notice, the Bible often talks about in this chapter about division, being divided. Divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. Okay, verse number six. So we've gone for the Europeans, verse number six, and the sons of Ham, Kush, now remember Ham, he would have his son would be cursed, remember by Noah in the previous chapter, and that would be Canaan, but you'd look at his sons here, it says uh, Kush and Mizraim and Put, or Put, and Canaan, okay? Now the Kush, Kush or the Kushites would become the Ethiopians, okay? I mean, even if you just did a Google for Kushites, It'll show you that basically these are Europe, uh, Ethiopians. Okay, so this is now Africa. We're talking about Africa here. And then Mizraim. Mizraim would be the country next to Ethiopia, which is Egypt. Okay, they're the Egyptians. Uh, Put, that would be the people from Libya. Oh, sorry, Libya is, is next, to, next to Egypt in northern, northern Africa. Sorry, I got that confused. And then it says Canaan. And Canaan, of course, the Canaanites, obviously. That's, that's one of the easy ones for us. Uh, Canaan, which was cursed by Noah. Um, but even though they were cursed by Noah, you know, they're still, they can still be saved. I don't want you to get this idea that just because this is the case or people were ungodly, you know, Jesus Christ was still their, is their, still, still their Savior. He came to die for their sins. And in fact, one of the apostles of Jesus Christ was Simon the Canaanite. Simon the Canaanite, okay? So, yes, these, these people were cursed, of course, um, but... Jesus Christ came to be the curse for us, okay? So, of course, anybody, even if you're, you're, you're cursed in that sense, the descendants, is, the descendants could still be believers of the Lord Jesus Christ. They can still be saved. Verse number seven. Verse number seven. And the sons of Cush, Seba, and Havilah, 
and Sabta and Ramah and uh, Sabtecha and the sons of Ramah, Sheba and Dedan. All right. So what we'll, do, we'll keep, we'll, what, what I want to do, I want us to just skip to verse 13 for now. So I don't want to lose what we're up to. Let's skip to verse 13. We're just going through the descendants of, 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 uh, of Ham here. In verse number 13, it says, And Mizraim and Ladim and Anam and Lehabim and Nephitim and uh, Paphrusim and Cashel. Rob, can you come up and read it for me again? <laughs> no, so let's stop here. And, and Cashelim, out of whom came Philistine. Now, that, that should sound familiar if you know your Bibles pretty well. And then it says, and Kaphtarim. Okay? So Philistine is basically the progenitor of the Philistines. Okay? We read about the Philistines as being one of the primary enemies to Israel. Um, of course, you know, Goliath was a Philistine. You know, Goliath, who David defeated, was a Philistine. So this is where their descendants or their ancestor comes from. Um, and some people make the mistake, I understand why, but they make the mistake of thinking that Palestinians today, you know, those that live in, the, uh, in, in Palestine, that they're also Philistines. Okay? Now, they may live in the same areas as the, as the Philistines today, but they're not the same people. Okay? They're not the same people as the, as the Philistines. And uh, the reason why um, the people that live in Palestine became known as the Palestinians, that was not a, a name that was known throughout, throughout history. Okay? After World War I, when the British would take control of the land, they started to call the people that lived on the land of Palestine the Palestinians. They started to call them. Now, they were known as Palestinians whether they were Muslim or whether they were Jews or whether they were just something else. My point is the Palestinians are a mix of people, a mix of different faiths. Okay? You could have been a Jew living on the land during that time and you would be called a Palestinian. Okay? And so, you know, this, this, is, this is what's funny about, well, not funny, I mean, it's, it's so wicked, about, you know, supporting one nation just, called, they called, just because they're called Israel versus the Palestinians is that, you know, these people are, are made of Jews and Muslims and, and a mix of all kinds of people. It's the same type of people. You're just choosing one side over another because of their religion, okay? Because Palestinians are predominantly Muslims, you know, and, and Israel are predominantly uh, Jews, and so people choose who they want to support, you know, based on a false religion, based on a false religion. Now, how many, how many of you guys care so about, you know, the, the, the battles in the past between the Serbs and the Croatians, okay? You know, the Serbs and the Croatians are basically the same kind of people. They're, they're the same Slavic people. They've been, they've been intermarried, you know, they, yeah, they've got the same descendancies. But you know what differentiates between the Croatians and the Serbians? Well, the Croatians are Catholics, predominantly, and the Serbians are predominantly Orthodox. Okay? So who are you going to choose, you know, in, in, their, in, in their battles, in their previous wars and, and previous conflicts? Who are you going to support? Well, it's, the, it's the same people, you know? And you're going to have to make a, you make a decision, I support this or that because of their false religion. I mean, how ridiculous to choose a side of a false religion. That's what happens today in churches. I'm going to support Israel. Yeah. It's a false religion. In fact, the Muslims have a greater respect of Jesus, and I know it's another Jesus, but still, right, than the Jews. The Jews believe Jesus is a false prophet. They believe he's burning in hell, in, in, in uh, basically burning excrement, all right, in hell today. You know, they believe he was cursed, that he's wicked. At least the Muslims think that he was a, you know, a, uh, a prophet of God, <laughs> which, which is true, but he's beyond that. He's not just a man. He's not just a prophet. Look, they're both wicked, false religions. I'm not saying Islam is better than Judaism or Judaism is better than Islam. I'm just saying, start thinking for yourself. You know, start thinking about, hey, these are people that Jesus came to die for. They both deserve to hear the gospel. They both need to hear the gospel. They both need to be saved. And in fact, many Jews today are reprobate because how, how long can you go denying Christ you know, and speaking blasphemies against him before God gives you over? You know? So be, be mindful. You know, don't, don't, don't drink the Kool-Aid. You know, God, I, lo I love how God gives us this information because we can then learn from it okay? and, and apply these things. We don't become racist. We don't start elevating one nation above another because of false religion. How ridiculous. <laughs> That's crazy. Anyway, let's keep going. Verse number 15, verse number 15. 
And Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth. So Sidon, if you guys know, we went through the book of Luke before, we had people from Tyre and Sidon. These were Gentile nations from Tyre and Sidon. Many of them would come to Christ and be healed and hear his preaching. Many of them would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so uh, this is, these are descendants of Canaan. Once again, hey, Canaan was cursed. Hey, but his descendants, did, some, a lot of them did the right thing. When Christ came, they believed on him, okay, and they sought after him. Um, and then Heth would be the progenitor of the Hittites. You read about them in the Bible. Verse number 16, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites, and the Gergesites. So those people are mentioned many times in the Bible as well. And the Hivites, and the Archites, now, the archite will be the progenitor of basically the Lebanese, okay? Um, and the Sinite, verse 18, and the Arvidites. Now, the Arvidites, they settled in modern-day Syria, okay? But they're not quite the Syrians, okay? They, they settled in what we call modern-day Syria, but they're not really the Syrians as a predominant. They're sort of a smaller um, type group of people that live in Syria. And then it says, and the Zemorites and the... Uh, Hamathites, and afterward were the families of the Canaanites spread abro abroad. So here's the thing about the Canaanites as well you need to keep in mind. We don't know a lot about them because, I mean, well, many of them were wiped out. When, when uh, you know, Joshua would lead, lead Israel into Canaan, yes, many of them survived, many of the people were, were left to live, but the command from God was to wipe them completely out, to wipe them out. So, uh, you, know, many, you know, a lot of these people, we don't really know anything about them because... They probably were wiped out okay, throughout history. And that's another thing you've got to keep in mind as you go through these things. You're not necessarily going to find every name, somebody that, you know, or pe group of people that live in modern day nations because of wars and because of you know, pestilences and things that happen throughout history. A lot of people could have been wiped out for, that were descendants of these people. Verse number 19. And the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, and as thou comest to Gerah, unto Gaza, Gaza, as thou goest unto Sodom and Gomorrah, and Adma and Zeboim, even unto Lasha. So here's what's interesting: the Sodom and Gomorrah. We know how wicked these people became. Okay, they became extremely wicked. God would rain down fire and brimstone upon them, and they were descendants of Canaan. And of course, Canaan, remember with the curse, kind of makes sense to me that these people would become. Some of these people would become extremely wicked, and God, God would you know rain down fire and brimstone. I kind of wonder: is that part of the curse that you know? Um, Noah prophesied of as well in the previous chapter it would make sense to me verse number 20 these are the sons of Ham after their families after their tongues in their countries and in their nations okay so we've gone through the sons of, of Ham now now we're going to go on to Shem verse number 21 and to Shem also so Shem is where we get the term like you, another way of saying Shem is Sem okay and that's where we get the terms the Semites from okay now, um, basically, if you are, a, you know, if you hate the Jews or something, which I don't, okay, don't ever say that, okay? I'm saying everyone's equal in the sight of God, all right? But here's the thing. If you do, people will call you an anti-Semite, okay? And that's where the term, term comes from. But what you'll find is the word Semite, or people, the Semites are a large group of people, okay? A large group of people here. And, of course, you know, uh, the Israelites of old in the Old Testament would be descendants of uh, Shem here. But verse number 22, in the children of Shem, Elam, now Elam would be the progenitor of the Persians. So Eve, that, that's your people. Okay, that's your grandfather there, Elam. And Asher, okay, Asher would become the progenitor of the Assyrians. So that's like the, um, you know, a, a minority group in, in Iraq that are largely Christian, at least have a Christian background to some extent. And then it says, um, and Arphaxad, the, he's the progenitor of the Chaldeans. And Lud and Aram, and Aram would be the progenitor of the Syrians. Okay, now the language of the Syrians is Syriac. Okay, Syriac, but another name given to that is Aramaic. Yeah, so that's where we get Aramaic from, from his name Aram. Aram, Aramaic. Okay, uh, verse number 23. And the children of Aram, Uz, now that one's an interesting one, are the land of Uz, is where we read about Job. You know, Job would live on the land of Uz, so it's possible that. Um, uh, Job was a descendant of, of Uz here. Uh, and then it says, And Hol, he would be the progenitor of the Armenians. And Githa, he would be the progenitor of Pakistan and Af Afghanistan people. And Mash, that's the people of Kuwait. Mash. All right. 
Hope this is interesting for you guys. Let's go through this, all right? Verse number 24. And Aphaxad begat Selah, and Selah begat Eber. All right, so keep your finger there and turn to Luke chapter 3, please. We're going to go to the genealogy of Jesus Christ here. Luke chapter 3. Because Eber would be the line that Jesus Christ would come, from, come out of, okay? Eber. Yeah. Luke chapter 3, verse 34. Luke chapter 3, verse 34. It says, this is of course the, you know, um, one of the genealogies of Christ, speaking of Christ being a son of, and then it keeps going on. And it says here, verse 34, which was the son of Jacob, which was the son of Isaac, which was the son of Abraham. So we're going back, okay? We're working our way back which was the son of Pharaoh, which was the son of Nacor, which was the son of Sarich, which was the son of Regu, which was the son of Phalak, which was the son of Heba. Okay, so in the New Testament, we've got Heba with a H, and in the Old Testament, we've got Eber without the H. Okay, so this is where we deride the term the Hebrews from. Okay, when you talk about the Israelites, or Abraham being a Hebrew, the reason he's called a Hebrew is because he would be a descendant of Heber, okay? So, if that's interesting, go back to Genesis chapter 10, please. Genesis chapter 10, verse 25. Genesis chapter 10, verse 25. That's why, again, the Israelites were known as the Hebrews, because they would come through that line of Eber or Heber. Verse number 20, uh, Genesis 10, verse 25. And unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided, Okay? So here's what's interesting. Remember, we, I talked about pay attention to when this chapter talked about divisions and stuff like that. Well, it seems like Eber would call his son Peleg because the nations were divided. And of course, in the next chapter, we get the detail of why the nations got divided. And that has to do with the Tower of Babel. Okay? So the best way I can understand this is that the story of the Tower of Babel and how God confounded the language would be around the time that Peleg would be born in order for his father to call him by that name. Okay, so that's what the, when the Bible talks about the, the places being divided, that's because of what we're going to learn in the next chapter next week, all right? And then it says, For in his days was the earth divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Okay, Joktan. So Peleg would be, would, you know, Abraham and the Israelites would come, you know, we said Eber and then from Peleg, okay, but there was a, his brother was Joktan. And this is, this is important for you to remember, okay? So the Israelites of the Old Testament, remember this would be descendants of Peleg, but Peleg had a brother called Joktan, okay? Keep that in mind as we keep going through this, all right? And the sons of Joktan, we're going to read here very quickly, would basically would make up the, the most significant part of the Arabian people, okay? Most of the Arabian people would be uh, descendants of Joktan. Verse number 26, And Joktan begat Elmodad, and Shelef, and Hazar, Maveth, and Jirah, and Hadoram, and Uzal, and Dikla, and Obal, and Abimael, and Sheba. I'll stop at Sheba because you guys are probably familiar with the Queen of Sheba. The Queen of Sheba would come to Solomon to see how great God, you know, how God had blessed the nation of Israel, to see their riches, to see their power, but also to learn great wisdom from Solomon. And we learn later on in the New Testament that Solomon gave this queen the gospel. You know, she got saved. And... Um, you know, I, I, I may have taught on Queen Sheba in the past, and if I did, I probably made a mistake, and I said she came from, from Africa, okay? But actually, the descendants here are Arabians, okay? So from the Middle East, okay? And I looked this up on the internet, and basically, there's divided people. No, she was from Africa. No, 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 she was from, you know, Arabia. You know, but as I've gone through this, I actually now believe she come from Arabia, all right? And... Um, uh, verse number 29, oh, because uh, people say that Sheba was um, Ethiopia, but we've already seen um, that the Kashites, the Kashites were the Ethiopians. But then again, I mean, th there's mix, there's people that are mixing all the time, so I don't know, you know, <laughs> you know these are things you just, you just have to take, a, a, you know, a, a biblical approach and understand how human history evolves and changes over time as well. Verse number 29, and Ophir and Havilah and Jobad, all these were the sons of Joktan. And their dwelling was from Misha, as thou goest unto Sephar, a mount of the east. Now, the reason I wanted you to understand that these are descendants of Joktan and not of Peleg, because out of Peleg would come the Israelites, is because of the name mentioned here in um, verse, number, verse number 30. It says, these, these 
um, Arabians, as thou goest unto Sifa, a mount of the east. So this is where they resided, okay? And this is where we get the term the Sepharic Jews from. The Sepharic Jews, okay? So the Sepharic Jews are not your Eastern European Jews, but are kind of like your North African or Western European Jews. A lot of the Jews that came from Portugal and Spain and Northern Africa, they're you're like your darker-headed ones and stuff like that. They're known as Sepharic Jews. Now, what, the reason I wanted to bring that to your attention is that we've got these two groups of Jews, right? The Ashkenazi Jews that are European and the Sepharic Jews. And they all claim to be, you know, descendants of Old Testament Israel or the Israelites, but none of them are in that line. <laughs> none of them are in that line. Like, I'm, I'm just going to go with what the Bible teaches me here, okay? Again, I understand there's intermixing, intermarriage, people move, all this stuff happens. But it's, it's funny to me that the modern day Israelites, we call them by these names and they're not even descendants from Abraham or, you know, or the Old Testament or the Israelites. So, you know, the Sepharic Jews, you know, they, they're, they're descendants of Joktan, not of Peleg. Okay. So I just thought that was interesting. Verse 9, and again, just shows you how stupid it is for us to be elevating one people over another. We don't even know where they're from. Who cares? It's not important. It's not important. Okay. I mean, it's important for us so we know our geography, we know the people, the people that people, you know, God is fighting against, you know, some interest to yourself. Maybe, you know, you, you can see a little bit of your background and who your grandfather would have been. But at the end of the day, we're all one blood. You know, we're all from Noah. And uh, verse number 31, verse number 31. These are the sons of Shem and their families after their tongues in their lands, after their nations. These are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations. And by these were the nations divided, this is the word again, divided in the earth after the flood. All right. Now, what I want to do is go back to verse number eight. I hope that was interesting for you guys. That's basically a lot of my, re a lot of my time researching was basically going through these names. And obviously, I don't have an answer to every name there, but you can kind of see where people come from, or at least these nations and these families. And uh, let's go back to verse number eight now, because I want to talk about Nimrod. So Nimrod is someone that's very... Uh, I don't know, he's got, a, he's got a bit of a bad reputation, you know, in the secular world. Um, and I'm just going to, look, one thing I, I want to tell you guys is, I always, I always cherish my natural reading of the Bible, okay? As a saved person who has the Holy Ghost, okay, I want to know the Bible, I'm sure God wants me to know my Bible, and especially as a young person, you read through the Bible, and you're reading things, a lot of things just come naturally. You know, knowing that Jesus is the Son of God just comes naturally. Once you read that name, like almost a thousand times in the New Testament, and you constantly see him being referred to as the Son of God, that's just a natural thing. You don't then start to, oh, hold on, maybe it's the Holy Spirit. And maybe he's God the Father. No, no, that's where you, 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 know, you start to, to you know, really, uh, tr you know, you, you bring your own, you know, your, your own preconceived ideas, your own, you know, limits of your heart and of your mind and of your flesh, and you start to change things or try to adapt things in the Bible, okay? I put a lot of weight into just my natural reading, okay? And sometimes when someone says, oh, that's about that, I'm like, really? And does the Bible actually say that, okay? Because I was on the plane one day down to Sydney, I was sitting next to a Jehovah Witness woman, and she started to say to me, oh, that Nimrod, have you heard about Nimrod? And she started to tell me about all these wicked things that, no, look, maybe he was wicked, I don't know. But he started to tell me all these wicked things that he did. And I said to her, can you just show me that in the Bible? She's like, uh, well, then she put out her app. She had like a movie about Nimrod. You know, she wanted to show me that. And I was like, but it's, it, are you, are you, the things you're saying to me, are they in the Bible? You know, you told me that you believe the Bible. You told me that your faith is based on the Bible. Can you show me that in the Bible? And she was stumped, okay? Because here's the thing, the Jehovah Witnesses do not believe in the Trinity, and they use the, the, let's call it a myth for now, I don't know if how true it is, about Nimrod to teach against the Trinity. Okay? And that's, what I want, that's why I wanted to separate these verses because we're, we're touching upon some other things here. But let's go back to verse number 8. Verse number 8. And, uh, well, actually, before we read it, before we read it, let, let me tell you about the, the story of Nimrod, the so-called so story of Nimrod. Apparently, Nimrod marries a woman called Samar... Semiramis, okay, marries this woman. Now, depending on the story that you're reading, it may have been his mother. He may have married his own mother. Okay, that's, that's one version of it. 
I, I couldn't work out, I, I looked at many references online I, and they had different versions of this, okay? But apparently Nimrod marries his mother, then he dies and he becomes worshipped as the sun god. Okay, he, he calls himself a god and is worshipped as the sun god. But then his mother, Samarias, gives birth to a son called Tamers, Tamers, and apparently she claimed that was Nimrod reincarnated. Um, and so you've got God the Father, God the Son, and Semiramis acting like a virgin Mary of the Roman Catholic Church. Okay? The other version that I found was that Nimrod marries Semiramis, but it wasn't his mother, and then she gives birth to Tamers, the son, and her son Tamers marries his mother because he's Nimrod reincarnated or something. Okay? And it's God the Father, God the Son. And that's why a lot of people think the Holy Spirit is like this female, you know. But here's the thing. I tried to look this up, and you know what? Prior to 1853, prior to 1853, there's no evidence of this story anywhere. There's, not, there's no written literature about this at all. There's no historical evidence. There's no historical writings. There's no archaeology that supports this, okay? In 1853, a guy called Alexander Hislop, which I believe was a pastor of a Presbyterian church in Scotland, he came up with this story, okay? He did some research, but really used a lot of conjecture, used a lot of just filling in the gaps to come up with the story of Nimrod marrying his mother, or whatever, Tamers marrying his mother, okay? So it's really just some wild conjecture, conjecture but it really caught fire. It became very popular and even to this day, a lot of Christians believe this story to be true, okay? Now, I, I no longer believe the story to be true when I started to look into it, because there's nothing else. It's just this one guy that came up with it, okay? There's nowhere, nothing else written about it um, in history, okay? But the problem I have with this, like I said, the Jehovah Witnesses, but not just the Jehovah Witnesses, will use this to preach against the Trinity and say, well, see, the Trinity is this pagan teaching all the way back to Nimrod, and his mother, and the Tamers, and marrying mother, someone married the mother, or something like that. Okay? And that's why they reject the Trinity, because they believe it's got these pagan roots. Now look, if, if this story was so important, you know, was so true, so important, and we should revolve our beliefs and our doctrines around it, God would have put it in the Bible. Okay? God would have put it in the Bible. All right? So, you know, I, I do, I'm going to take a lesson from all this later on as we go through it, okay? But let's just read what the Bible says. Let's just, let's just see what God says about Nimrod, okay? And again, I'm just I'm reading my Bible just naturally as a child. A lot of the doctrines I believe are just the stuff that I read naturally as a child, okay? Without any bias, any preconceived ideas, without any sort of, you know, fancy stories messing up my mind as I read things. But verse number eight, and Cush, again, you know, the, the progenitor of the Ethiopians, begat Nimrod, he began to be a mighty one in the earth. All right, so he becomes a mighty person. Verse number nine, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. So what, what do we learn about him now? He's a hunter, and he's a mighty hunter before the Lord. So there's something about the Lord here, the Lord God, okay? Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. So whatever he was mighty for, he became known as the mighty hunter before the Lord. That was his title. Okay, that's what he became known as. So what we're going to do is basically just, just look at, so some people say Nimrod was this wicked man, right? You know, became the sun god. It, this is interesting because if he's, a, if he's calling himself God, it would be strange that his title would be a mighty hunter before the Lord, meaning that the Lord is not Nimrod, okay? I mean, that, that would be contradictive to what people say that he called himself a god or, or his mother called himself a god or something like that. But let's just have a look at this. If we go to, what does it mean to be before the Lord? Because people say, well, he was hunting for men's souls and he was hunting against the Lord. That's what it means by before the Lord. He was against the Lord. He was teaching false doctrine. He was damning people to hell. And he's this wicked man. But really, I mean, we should compare Scripture with Scripture. You know, we should take what the Bible says, especially the book of Genesis. We're looking at the book of Genesis. Let's see what the book of Genesis says. Keep your finger there and turn to Genesis 13, 13. Genesis 13, 13, the Bible says here, but the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Okay, I just want to show you this reference before the Lord in the Bible. Go to Genesis 18, 22, 18, 22, because you might say, well, see, these Sodom, they're wicked before the Lord. They're like against the Lord. That's what he means. 
Genesis 18.22. Genesis 18.22. The Bible says, And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. Okay? So, is this saying you're against the Lord, or is it saying you're in the presence of the Lord? But, uh, let's go to Genesis 19, verse 27. Genesis 19, 27. And Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. Now go to Genesis 27, verse 6. Genesis 27, verse 6. I just want you to see how the Bible uses this phrase, right? Genesis 27, verse 6. The Bible says, And Rebekah spake unto Jacob her son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau, thy brother, saying, Bring me venison, and make me savory meat, that I may eat, and bless thee before the Lord, before my death. Okay. So I think just looking at these passages and seeing how the book of Genesis at least, and look beyond, you look at the book of Exodus, because these were all written by Moses. You, you see this phrase used over and over and over again, before the Lord, before the Lord, before the Lord. And what it basically means is, in the presence of the Lord, you know, or how the, how, how the Lord perceives that, you know, how the Lord sees that. He saw the wickedness of Sodom, you know, that was brought up before, before him, you know. It, it was, it's how God sees something or that is in the presence of that happening, okay. I mean, I just want to go where the Bible teaches. I don't want to start, you know, twisting the scriptures here, okay. So if we look at Nimrod then, back to Genesis chapter 10, verse 9, and is the, look, the Bible tells us, the Holy Spirit is telling us that he's a mighty hunter before the Lord. My take is that this guy seemed maybe he's maybe okay. I'm not saying he's a believer. I'm not saying he's wicked. He could be wicked. I'm not saying he's the greatest person on the earth. I don't know. But why is it important that he's a mighty hunter? Again, keeping the themes of what we see in the book of Genesis is because in the previous chapter, God said you can eat animals and the fear of man came upon the animals that they would flee from man. And of course, now what do you need? You need hunters. You need people to go and hunt animals, right? This is a new skill that people need to learn. And what I read here is just a natural reading of that is that Nimrod became a great hunter. You know, became well known for his hunting techniques. You know, he probably was able to teach a lot of people and became mighty in that sense, became well known, you know, became famous because he became a great hunter. And it says before the Lord, now it seems like the Lord saw him as a great hunter. What that means, I can't really tell you. And then his reputation was they became Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Okay? I'm trying to be as, as biblical as I can. You can disagree with me. I'm just trying to be as biblical as I can. Okay? Without going to some material from the 1800s, which, have no, which has no historical backing. Okay? A lot of people would rather take the material from the 1800s with no historical backing. Okay? Than what I'm preaching today. Verse number 10. Let's go to uh, Genesis 10 verse 10. Genesis 10 verse 10. It says about Nimrod, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. So if Nimrod has a kingdom, of course, being a mighty person, he became a king. Okay? And Babel is you know, what we know as Babylon. Okay? That would be, and we know the Tower of Babel and stuff like that. And these other cities became a king uh, uh, you know, to these other cities here. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalni in the land of Shinar. Okay? Now, I just want to go and look at other references, what the Bible says about Nimrod, okay? So, keep your finger there, and uh, go to Micah chapter 5, Micah chapter 5. And while you're turning to the book of Micah, I'm going to read to you from 1 Chronicles chapter 1 verse 10, which is nothing, more, nothing new information, but just says, And Cush begat Nimrod, he began to be mighty upon the earth. Just reinforcing the fact, you know, that, Cush gave birth to Nimrod, and Nimrod was mighty, okay? But you guys are turning to Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. This is a prophecy of Jesus Christ. It says, but thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, that's for Bethlehem where Jesus will be born. It says, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be a ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from old, from everlasting. So that's about Jesus. Now we'll drop down to verse number 5. Verse number 5, it says, And this man, that's about Jesus, and this man, Jesus, shall be the peace when the Assyrians shall come into our land 
and when he shall tread in our palaces, then shall we rise against him seven shepherds and eight principal men, and they shall waste the land of Assyria with the sword, and the land of Nimrod in the entrances thereof. Thus shall he deliver us from the Assyrian when he cometh into our land, and when he treadeth within our borders. Okay? So saying, what's that about? Mentions the land of Nimrod here. Because remember, Nimrod was the king over Babel, which became Babylon. Okay, Babylon. And the southern kingdom of Judah would be taken into captivity by who? By Babylon. They were taken into Babylonian captivity. And why does it keep talking about the Assyrians as well in this verse? Is because the northern kingdom of Israel would be taken into captivity by the Assyrians. Okay? So this is a prophecy that Jesus Christ would come and deliver the Israelites from their enemies, from those that have taken them captive. Okay? But this is hundreds of years after Nimrod, right? The land of Nimrod, okay? Yes, they were wicked people. They had their false gods and religion when it comes to this time. But that doesn't really tell us anything about Nimrod himself, okay? Because, again, things change. Things develop. I mean, there's a lot of things that happen. Again, I'm not saying Nimrod was this godly man. I'm not trying to say that. I'm just saying, let's just stick to what the Bible says, you know, and let's not go beyond that. Let's not go beyond that because that's where you get into a lot of problems. Let's say Nimrod was a decent guy. Let's say that's the truth. You know, that he was a decent guy. And we're going, man, this guy's wicked. He's calling himself a god. You know, it's a reprobate. You know? I mean, this is pretty slack. <laughs> pretty bad on the guy, you know. But anyway, um, if you go back to Genesis 10 now, Genesis 10, we're almost done now. Genesis 10, we're almost done. Verse number 11. Verse number 11. Um, and it says here, out of, the, out of that land went forth Asia. So Asia, if you remember, he was a progenitor of the Assyrians. It says, and builded Nineveh. Okay, so Nineveh, we know the city of Nineveh, where Jonah was sent to preach. And the city of Rehoboth and Calah. Verse number 12. And reason between Nineveh and Calah, the same is a great city. Now, I'm not sure if it's saying reason is a great city. That's what it sounds like to me. But Nineveh, also in the book of Jonah, was called that great city. Or a, a, a great city, I think it's called in the book of Jonah. So it may be a reference to Nineveh. Maybe these were all great cities. I don't know. Okay, just a thought there. But what I want to take, we, we've gone through all the verses now in the chapter. I hope that was interesting. I'll try to wrap it up now. But there's three lessons that I want to take from, from this chapter. Three lessons that we can... I always want to try to take something applicable, all right? Three lessons. Number one is do not elevate extra biblical resources as truth. All right? The Bible, Jesus said in John 17, thy word is truth. Okay, if we're going to build our life, our practices, our doctrines, our way of living on truth, the only resource we have, guys, especially going that fine history, is this book. This, we know this is 100% correct. All right? And I love how God just tells us so much. Because it would be so easy to prove the Bible wrong if it was just written by men. Okay, and we men make mistakes. It'd be so easy to prove it wrong. Look at all those lists of names and where they went and all the geography and the peoples. Hey, we have the people today. <laughs> you know, the descendants of, of these names, we all have them today. You know, but if someone was just making things up, take the Book of Mormon. All right, the Book of Mormon, you know, the Mor Mormons, they have that book and they teach that basically, you know, um, in, in, uh, in the Americas, the primitive Indians, that they were Jewish people as well. And they talk about all these people, in, in, you know, all these native Indians, and talk about where they migrated and, and their family lines and all that kind of stuff. But none of that is supported by history. Like, no historical writings about it. There's no archaeology that can be found about these places and these people. And it proves the Book of Mormon false. Okay, but we have God here thousands of years ago giving us this information, and every time it's just proven right. You know, all the ar archaeology that gets digged up is just basically in line with the Bible. I mean, look, the, his, you know, the archaeologists may have their spin on things, you know, but at the end of the day, there's nothing that they found that's really contradictive to the Bible, okay? They might say, well, this is not, you know, we've not found any archaeology, ar archaeology evidence for this thing, but then many times, you know, some years later, they, they do find it, you know? I, I don't care. I'm not basing my faith on archaeology. You know, I'm basing that upon the Word of God, which is truth. It's always proven to be true. I'm not against extra biblical resources for a bit of information, but look, if the Bible does not really point to that, or not really supporting that strongly in any kind of sense, just, just put it aside as, as a story, you know, as, as a make-believe for now, and then if you do find things in the Bible that seem to be proven that true, then maybe you can start thinking about it, but don't waste your time, 
You got, you got, look, your, your time is limited on this earth. This Bible is a big book. I've read it several times, but when I study to preach a sermon, I'm learning new things all the time. I and mean, there's plenty, I think you've got forever, the whole life, to learn things in the Bible. Just keep your study in the Word of God. All right? Second lesson I want to take from this is don't go around worshiping the Jews. Please, don't be a church. I don't want you to be people that worship, you know, you've got to bless these people. Oh, man, God's got the special eye upon them. And what we see from the Word of God, these titles, Sephardic Jews and Ashkenazi Jews, they're not even the Old Testament Israelites. Right? I mean, like, again, I'm not saying that they, that they don't have any descendancy, because again, we've got thousands of years of intermixing and all those kind of things. But the titles they give themselves... Why should I? Even, even if you were people that God says you should worship, I, when, why would I worship them then? If they're not even from that line of, of Peleg and, and Eber and Abraham and all those kinds of things, you know? So please don't go around worshiping um, the Jews. You know, don't start preferring one people over another, you know, and especially over religion, false religion. Don't start favoring people over false religion. How ridiculous of you as a believer of Jesus Christ. You know, how, how anti-Christian is that, to, to be favoring one nation over, over the other, you know? And then the third point that I have here, guys, is that Jesus came for all. As I was going through this list of people, I started to, I mean, I already know this, I already know we're all one blood, but I started to realize, you know, because you still think of nations, you know? I, I consider myself Australian, you know? And I, you know, a little bit Chilean because that's my ethnicity and stuff like that. But as, as I'm reading through all these names, I'm saying, man, these are just my grandfather. This is my grandfather. That's my uncle. That's my, <laughs> you know, I probably, you know, my great, great grandfather probably married that person's great, 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 great granddaughter. You know, we're probably all mixed. And I just started to, as I'm going through this chapter, I realized, man, we're all one blood. You know, I'm not going to favor. It doesn't matter. I don't care what you look like. I don't care about the color of your skin. And this is how we should be as believers. But I'm just reminded as I'm going through this, you know, thank God for Noah. Thank God that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord and that through him, you know, Jesus Christ came for all. Jesus Christ came and died for all. You know, he didn't come just for the Jews and, well, they rejected me. It's like, what, God doesn't have control over his, over things like that. Or the Jews have more control over God. So, well, I need to go to plan B. I need to die on the cross now and offer myself to the Gentiles. No, Jesus Christ came and died for all. And the Bible says in Acts 17, 26, and have made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. God has made us one blood. We're one blood, guys. Okay, we're one blood. Uh, take your Bibles and turn to Isaiah 49, please. Isaiah 49. Isaiah 49, verse 5. Isaiah 49, verse 5. We're almost done now. Isaiah 49, verse 5. And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him. Though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. And he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant, to rise up the tribes of Jacob, so obviously the Israelites, and to restore the preserved of Israel. So we know that God does care about Israel. Then it says, I will give also... I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation, even unto the end of the earth. So Jesus Christ came to be a saviour to the Jews, yes, but also to the Gentiles. Okay? And we see that here he's speaking to Isaiah, but this is also a prophetic of Jesus Christ, who would be a light to the Gentiles. And um, I'm going to quickly just wrap it up here in Mark 11:17. You don't need to turn there just quickly. This is when Jesus Christ came to cleanse the temple. And he says, you know, and he taught, saying unto them, Is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer? To all nations the house of prayer. But ye have made it a, a den of thieves. Ye have made it a den of thieves. So, you know, the temple of God. We often talk about it, we, about, you know, Israel, Old Testament Israel. And that's important. The Israelites did come to worship and to serve the Lord and offer sacrifices and to pray. But God said His temple would be a house of prayer to all nations. You see, in the Old Testament, anybody of any nation, like we saw the Queen of Sheba, you know, they could come and, and offer their praise and their worship. It wasn't just for the Jews. It wasn't just for the Israelites, okay? You know, God is a savior of all mankind. Jesus Christ came to, to, to die for all of us. So please, 
I know a lot of you have been brainwashed to think you're a second-class citizen in the eyes of God. You know, the Jews first and then you guys last. No, we're children of God. You know, you're the sons and daughters of God if you believed on Christ. I mean, that's the best place to be, knowing that God is our Father. You know, better than knowing who the Father is here in the, in the physical lineage, more important to know that God is our Father and you become a son of God by believing on Jesus Christ. Let's pray.